Uh, thanks. Uh, so the video that's been looping here now every 12 seconds uh, is, act, or is a series of photos that were taken from an astronaut on the space station. So they're actual pictures of Minx as it was deployed in May. Um, just like a couple weeks after I defended my dissertation, which is what was pushing me to graduate when I did, because this thing took a lot of time when it came out. Um, so Minx is the one that's out front there, uh, and the one just behind it is from the University of Michigan, uh, CubeSat called Cadre. Uh, and I know it looks like it's firing straight down at the ground. Uh, that's Africa. It, I promise you, it's still in orbit. Uh, it's been communicating since May. We've been getting great results from it, and it's been a, a really successful mission so far. And it will continue to run for another few months. It's, it is going down in altitude with time, and that's accelerating now because of atmospheric drag. So it'll be another few months before it burns up in the atmosphere. Uh, so first, why CubeSats? There's Hubble, and there's Minx to scale. Um, so I want to make a few points on this slide. First, all of the basic functionality that you find in a, a normal size large spacecraft, you'll also find in CubeSat. So it can point wherever you need it. It gets power from the sun usually. Uh, it has onboard processing and storage and all those sorts of things. It's just now been miniaturized to the point where we can put it into a little tiny spacecraft. Um, yeah, the, the, the other major point is that uh, you can get, well, we'll never be able to do the same science with these two platforms at these scales, but we'll be able to do different science that's valuable, and both of them bring advantages to the, to the table. So, um, because this is a CubeSat talk, I'll, talk, I'll focus on the advantages of CubeSats. Uh, so, for example, for the, the price of Hubble, you could have 2,500 minxes, um, and that's before you factor in any sort of economy of scale for doing these things. We didn't do this with Minx because it wasn't relevant for the science, but there are science objectives where you would want a constellation of CubeSats, for example, all around the Earth so you can get simultaneous measurements of something uh, at multiple positions, which you can't do with a, a monolithic spacecraft. So that's one advantage of, of CubeSats, and you, you can't do uh, dozens and dozens of enormous spacecraft for the for, uh, a cost that's reasonable. Uh, one of the other advantages is that the uh, time the timeline is also less for CubeSats. It's instead of decade or decades to produce one of these things, it's a few years. So that makes them really good for missions of opportunity. Um, and one type of mission of opportunity that's just come out recently, the NASA Planetary Division is has a request for proposals out to. They're basically saying, we're going to be sending all of these space, big spacecraft to all the planets anyway. So let's put some CubeSats in there with it to see what more science we can get out of the missions as a whole. And so we're working on some proposals to do that sort of thing as well. Uh, so that's another type of advantage, another type of mission of opportunity. Um, also, f you can fund. W w Hubble was so expensive and James Webb now is so expensive that we can only afford to do one or two of these at a time. So there's a huge effort and everyone's focused on getting that done. Whereas with a CubeSat uh, or CubeSats, you can fund a whole bunch of them and you can have institutions all around the country, all, everyone working on a different thing. Uh, so you can, you can address multiple science objectives at the same time for the same fixed cost. Uh, so that's another advantage. Uh, but the one, the, the reason that we were able to do Minx and the science motivation there was that, that we didn't need something bigger than what Minx was. The science instrument we got is just a commercial product that was miniaturized uh, for geology. And so we were able to just leverage that and throw it in Minx. And it was already small and low power and low mass. Uh, so we were able to just throw it in and get the sci address science questions that are long standing in solar physics, which I'll describe in a few minutes, uh, without going to a larger spacecraft. Uh, and you can, you can get valuable science out of this size spacecraft. We've actually had Minx featured on like the front page of NASA.gov a few times, um, like right on the home page. And the, uh, 
Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, the top of the entire NASA hierarchy, just a few weeks ago, he gets weekly updates about all, what's going on in all of NASA, and MINK's data and analysis were included in that just a, a couple weeks ago. So it is uh, not, not just valuable for the science, but it can also be high profile science. So I, I hope to convince you of that uh, in the next section, which will focus on sort of the science that MINX is addressing. Uh, so first, MINX stands for the Miniature X-ray Solar Spectrometer. The solar part is we're observing the sun. And so this is what the sun looks like in the wavelengths we're observing with MINX data and a couple other instruments. Uh, so in the top left, this is the Hinode spacecraft, the X-ray telescope. And this is showing you what the sun looks like in the wavelengths that we're observing with MINX. And you can see there's uh, bright local regions. These are called active regions. They're what overlie sunspots. And occasionally you see little bright pops, and those are they're highly localized, and those are called solar flares. And that's primarily what MINX is looking at. Uh, in the top right is uh, data from the GO spacecraft, from the X-ray sensor. So more or less, that's like if you took the Hanode image and s added up all the pixels and then plotted that versus a function of time. And that's sort of like what you're looking at in the top right with GOES. And then in the bottom right is, uh, are the MINX data. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with looking at spectra all the time, it's easy to look at a, the, the movie of the sun and understand sort of what you're looking at. But if you're not used to looking at the whole sun as a, as a single spectrum, then you can sort of think about it as uh, a prism. And what we're doing is in each one of these columns in the, in the plot uh, is a different color of light. And we're measuring the brightness of each one of those colors. And we're doing that as a function of time, which is why it's a movie showing, shown there. So uh, uh, if you, if you, the other way you can sum things up is if you summed up all of the Minx data across all the colors, you would also get the GOES curve. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so we're observing uh, the sun from orbit because all of the x-ray light gets absorbed, absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. You've probably seen figures like this before where some generic sunlight comes in, some of it Reach, penetrates the Earth's atmosphere, gets absorbed by the surface. Some of it gets reflected away, and some of it is absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere. For the X-rays, fortunately, none of them reach the ground uh, because we don't want to be constantly irradiated with the X-rays. So we have to do this in space, which is why Minx is in orbit, uh, and GOES and Hinode and all these other spacecrafts observing in similar wavelengths. Uh, but it's more interesting than that, the, the depth that the photons penetrate in the soft x-rays where Minx is observing is dependent on the wavelength of that light. So like the purpler light, the higher energy light will penetrate deeper than the lower energy stuff. Uh, and so when the, these photons from the sun are absorbed, what that's, what that's doing at the microscopic level oftentimes is there's an atom hanging out in the atmosphere. The photon comes in and is absorbed by the atom and it kicks off an electron. So now you have an ion. Um, and if you remember anything from even like high school chemistry, if you mess with the valence electrons of, of atoms, you change the chemistry. And so uh, models of the Earth's atmosphere uh, need to account for all this chemistry. And one of the things that they do is with the, these global circulation models that are looking at what the entire Earth's atmosphere does, uh, is they make predictions of what, how dense are the, each ion species as a function of altitude. So how many of some particular ion are there as a uh, per cubic centimeter. And right now they, they do not ma match, the predictions from the models don't match the measured densities in the atmosphere from balloons like you were just seeing in the NASA TV. And that's a problem. It means that either there's something wrong with the physics and the model or there's something wrong with the inputs, and we think it's one of the inputs. So they don't know what the distribution of soft X-ray light from the sun is that's coming in and doing this photoionization. So we're now able to provide that data. One of the co-investigators on MINX is uh, Stan Solomon. He works at the High Altitude Observatory and also conjunctive with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where these models are, are run and generated. Uh, 
And so he's doing a lot of this modeling effort to hopefully improve it. So Minx is looking, data is being used to drive models of the Earth's atmosphere. Then turning the science sort of back towards the sun, we've got our first paper uh, has now been reviewed and we've responded to it and it's back at the Astrophysical Journal uh, going through the second round of reviews from the reviewer just making sure everything was okay. And that had several or two major topics in it um, and I'll sort of largely talk about one of them more than the other here. So again here in the light blue you're looking at the GOES data. Um, it's a light curve and uh, like I said, the Minx data is, if you summed it all up, then you would get the GOES light curve. So one way to think about the GOES data is that it's sort of like if you took your favorite song and collapsed all of the frequencies or pitches down into just two bins, just a high pitch and a low pitch, you probably would not be able to tell what the song was anymore. But you would still be able to get some information, like the introduction of the song is probably quiet, the chorus is probably loud, and that's useful, but you're losing a lot of information. Uh, and so I've done exactly that. And I wonder if any of you can tell me what song this is. <laughs> it, it had to be this song. It couldn't have been a different song. So that's sort of the difference between Goes and Minx. Minx, we can hear everything. We can, we can hear what the sun's saying to really make the analogy go too far. Um, <laughs> and Goes, it's sort of blurred, but still inf inf useful. Uh, and just for the sake of comparison, we can collapse down the Minx data and compare it to GOES, and that's what you're seeing in the plot. So the GOES data is the blue and the Minx data is the yellow. Uh, and you can see that during the flare time, they more or less match, but during the pre-flare time, there's a pretty big gap. So the GOES data is sort of bottoming out before it, it's, uh, and the sun is actually less intense than what GOES is measuring. And that good matching that you see there is only after we've applied a scaling factor to GOES. So uh, this is something that NOAA, who, uh, is the, which is the institute that runs GOES, they're aware of this scaling factor, um, but it turns out that you can't just divide by 0.7, which is what the scaling factor is. It's more complicated than that. It's a function of a lot of things, and so that's sort of, that comparison is what we're doing with Minx right now, and a lot of that is described in the first Minx paper that we've done. And one, this thing, the last bullet here, uh, is important, but I didn't do a whole slide on it. It's basically that you can use the Minx data to address one of the biggest problems in solar physics, which is how this, this corona is heated. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense, really. The, the, we don't know how to explain how the, the surface of the sun, the photosphere, can be 6,000 Kelvin, and the corona above it can be millions of Kelvin. It's, seems to violate the laws of thermodynamics, like if you went up to a fire, put your hands by the fire, it's hot, and if you move away, it gets colder, but that doesn't happen with the sun. And there are various theories to try and explain this, and what we're doing with Minx is lending evidence to support some theories and say others may not occur, at least in these cases. So it's also high impact science that we can do with Minx. Uh, and there's other stuff that we're doing too that's sort of more at a high level uh, ongoing science. These are all the sorts of things you would expect to see from any science satellite mission. Things like uh, having dedicated sessions at conferences. We're having one at the American Geophysical Union that's occurring in San Francisco in December. It's going to be all about soft x-rays and minks. Uh, also having coordinate op coordinated observations with other spacecraft that observe similar things like Hinode. Chris Moore has been doing a lot of that coordinated observation stuff with Hinode for us. Uh, and if GOES is observing all the time, so we don't need to coordinate with them, but we can do uh, conjunctive science like I was showing in the previous slide. And then finally, as I mentioned, we're using Minx data to drive models, in this case, atmos Earth atmospheric models, but it can also be used as Chris Moore, well, part of his dissertation is looking at MHD simulations for the sun, uh, magnetohydrodynamic. So basically this, this corona is, is largely driven by the magnetic field of the sun, and so you can model that as well and compare it with Minx data. 
So those are all the sorts of things you would expect to see from any science satellite, and it just happens that this one is extremely small, like can fit into a briefcase. Um, despite that, you'll still find all of the same stuff inside the spacecraft that you'll find in Hubble or any other bigger spacecraft. Um, this is the actual assembly order, but reversed, so that you can see it torn apart. Uh, so you've got like down here an electronic stack, so that includes the power routing to provide power to all the systems that require it, uh, a battery to store power from the solar arrays so that you can operate during eclipse times, uh, the processor board, like the brain of the spacecraft, which includes you know, a, a processing chip, a CPU, and a, a storage, which in our case is just a two gig SD card. Industrial class, though, not a regular one. Uh, and then also a, a radio board. So we're using a UHF radio, and that's the, the bottom board there, which is connected to the antenna, which is literally a tape measure for ours. It's like the perfect monopole that we didn't have to design. We just bought one from the hardware store. And I'll show videos at the end of that being deployed. Uh, and then the science instruments, the main one is called the X123, that's what you st saw the spectra from in the slides before. That's the commercial thing that was developed for geology. They needed a way to determine the composition of rocks while they were in the field, uh, and so it needed to be portable and handheld, so they developed this thing. And that, out there they don't have x-rays just floating around, so they bring an x-ray source, shine it on the rock, and then measure the reflection with uh, the X123. It's also used for looking at paintings and TSA to find bombs, but we put a little tiny aperture in front of it and make, make it look at the sun. And we had to modify it a little bit to be compatible with operating where there's no air, because some of the parts get hot, so you have to heat sink them. But really very, very minor modifications to that primary science instrument. And then we have a couple others that are basically just support the, the primary science instrument. Like I said, solar panels. And then the main thing uh, that I'll talk about for the rest of the slide is the pointing control. So that's everything you need to know how the spacecraft is oriented in space and actively point it so the solar panels and the instruments are looking at the sun. And that's all encapsulated in that little box at the top that's about this big. Uh, it's very densely packed with technology. All the same stuff you'll find on bigger missions. Um, but this is a place where we applied the lesson that's here at the bottom to, at least for these CubeSat missions, which are relatively low budget and <laughs> largely student populated, is to pick one or two hard things to do and then outsource the rest. So the pointing control we outsourced because that was really hard. And fortunately, there, we had really good timing. There's a local company in Boulder called Blue Canyon Technologies that was developing one of these things right when we were developing Minx. And they have really close ties to LASP. They've hired some of the Minx students after they graduated. They've hired away some of the engineers from LASP. They've used test facilities here. And now we've been the first to fly their, uh, their pointing system on orbit, uh, which is really good for them because it's been working great. Uh, and everybody is buying these things. JPL has about a dozen of them. Two of them are going to be flying to Mars in a couple years. Um, the military is using them and universities all around the country are using them. So there's been a lot of interest in how well this pointing is doing. And their spec is that they would point to 11 arc seconds. We've seen with Minx that the actual pointing is better than that. It's about eight arc seconds, which is like pointing at the US Capitol building from LA, which is way better pointing than we need for Minx because the sun's half a degree and our field of view is really big. So that's overkill for what we needed for Minx, but it was, it was fine because it still met those requirements and we didn't have to develop any of that. So that was really nice. Uh, so, like I said, all the same stuff in big satellites you'll find here. Propulsion is missing. We, we didn't need it so we don't have it. But all pretty, this looks pretty much like most CubeSats will. Uh, the sad news is that many CubeSats don't work. Uh, this is a plot showing the last 15 years and the CubeSat success rate. So all of this black space, the black void at the top are failed CubeSats. And that's not happy. CubeSats, one of the other things is they are inherently more risk tolerant than the big class missions where if that fails it's a big deal. But if a CubeSat fails it's not as big a loss. So that's part of the explanation for that. But a lot of the times it's just that 
people don't test their stuff like they should, uh, and you can do it without driving the cost up exorbitantly. So uh, that's the main way that I think that Minx has become one of the successful ones. We're adding to this green bar of fully successful missions. Minx one just reached its comprehensive mission success criteria a couple months ago. So we're now in the in the 2016 category, a green bar. And so testing is how we did that. Uh, to fail early and fail often. We, we didn't test and have everything work. We tested and had lots of things not work, and then we fixed them on the ground where you can still do that. Uh, and so there's four shown here and a fifth I'll just talk about. So shake, bake, point, and communicate. And the fifth one is to make sure you're power positive. Um, so shake, you go and you put the spacecraft on a table and it basically just shakes the hell out of it like a rocket launch. If you can't survive the rocket, you, you're going to have a failed mission. And you'd rather find that out during vibration testing than on orbit when you can't fix it. So the funny story about this one is that the deployer thing, this big rectangular tube at the top here, that is the same deployer you saw in the title slide for, at the space station. It's a spring-loaded box with a door in the front, and Minx is inside there. Uh, and then just in the front there, the doors, when we had this box, the doors happened to be broken at the time. So there's just two C-clamps holding it shut. So if those C-clamps vibrated off, they asked me to stand there and catch Minx if it flew out. <laughs> Which, <laughs> and I'd already been working on it for a couple years, and I did not want to drop it and have all of that just sh literally shatter at my feet. So there's not much happening in that video except for me just like shifting weight nervously and gulping and fortunately nothing bad happened. We've done three vibration tests across the two minxes and every one of them has been successful. Uh, the second one, bake uh, in vacuum. So this is thermal vacuum testing that we did just downstairs. Um, so you put the spacecraft into a vacuum and then you make it really with uh, temperature control surfaces and you make it really cold and you make it really hot to stress the system out. And you do that over and over again for like a week. And the, you're running it the whole time too. And the goal is to see if it ever stops running or if anything breaks. And we did find a lot of that with Minx. As soon as we pulled vacuum, it wouldn't turn on due to a mistake that I made with the batteries. But fortunately, we were able to figure out what that mistake was and swap it out with a spare and then go back into the tank the next day and then find more issues with primarily software and other things. But you basically just run it like that for a week and you learn a lot about the system, you make some fixes, and you learn the idiosyncrasies that you're just going to live with. So that's a very useful test to make sure that it can actually operate in an orbit-like environment. Uh, and then the bottom uh, left, pointing. So this is Minx on an air bearing table that Reconer maintenance garage. Um, it's basically a hemisphere that's floating on air, so there's no there's no torques on the system. And so the pointing system can then move where it needs to move without dragging on anything. Uh, and this is also just downstairs at last. We have a, a mirror on the roof that reflects the sun into a lab where we can keep things clean. And we shine that sun onto the sun sensor that's on the spacecraft. So what it should do is see the suns that way and then move that way and stay there. And it, it didn't at first for months, but we found, pro we found the problems there and fixed them, and then it did. And it was repeatable over and over again. So that was another really important test. There have been big missions that have gone on orbit, and they just there was a minus sign error somewhere, and it saw the sun was that way, and instead of going that way, it went minus that way, which kept it pointing away from the sun all the time. And you can figure all that out by just testing it on something like this. Uh, of course, it's easier for a CubeSat because it's only this big and it's not the size of a bus. So you can make a relatively small air bearing and do this test. Uh, and then uh, the bottom right, communications. So this is just up to 36 on the way to Superior. We pulled off the highway, uh, put Minx in a box to keep too much junk from getting on it. And then we were in the line of sight to LASP where our ground station is and we just let the spacecraft run with no cables. We saw it do its deployments autonomously like it was supposed to, 
And then we verified the, we call it the end-to-end -end communication. So the computer that's actually in the room right behind this room, uh, it, we, tell it, we have it send a command, it goes through the radio, goes up to the roof through the antenna, across the air, into the antenna on Minx, the tape measure antenna, through the radio into that processor, which then does the correct command, hopefully, and then spits something back. And we, it generates its own telemetry autonom autonomously every nine seconds and beacons that out so we can verify that everything works across the entire communications pipeline uh, so that when we get on orbit, we don't have to figure this out. Turns out we still did end up needing to figure some of this stuff out because going only up halfway to Superior wasn't as far as orbit, which is 400 kilometers. Uh, so we had way more gain than was realistic. So that was something we took about a week to figure out on Minx 1, and we've since upgraded the ground station and done some fixes for that. And then the last one that I don't have a movie for is making sure you're power positive. So all that means is that every orbit, when you're in sunlight, you generate enough power to recharge your battery all the way so that when you're in eclipse, you can get through it. If you're power negative, even a little bit, that means that you're just draining the battery a little bit more every time until the battery is dead and that's not good. Uh, so the way we, that we tested that was we have a solar array simulator, uh, which is just a gigantic power supply that you, we jacked in in place of the real solar panels, and then we simulated orbits. So with really long eclipse, with really short eclipse, running the system in all different sorts of power configurations, turning on instruments and turning them off, uh, and made sure that it could run. That also didn't work at first. We were power negative, we found, and so we had to make a modification, which ended up being the addition of just one little resistor uh, to make it power positive. But that's another way that you could just fail on orbit and then can't do anything about it. Uh, so one of the other things we did was we actually built two minxes, as I've kind of mentioned throughout. For first, we built a prototype where we built up all the electronics and found out whether or not they worked like we really thought they would. Uh, they did in most cases. Um, and then also the structure, we made sure everything would fit together. And we built the first Minx, which has been on orbit since May, and then we, in parallel, we built the second Minx, uh, where we were able to apply lessons learned immediately as we were doing things, like we need to make an extra notch that wasn't in the design to get this cable through or something. Uh, but because the launch is, is staggered from Minx-1, we're able to learn lessons from operating Minx-1 on orbit and make <coughs> Minx-2 better f for those lessons. Um, and I'll go over a, a couple of those in the next couple slides. But just for a reminder, a banana for scale, this is really tiny. Uh, it's hard to get your hands in there uh, to do cables, which is why we designed it so we wouldn't have a lot of cables. It, most of the boards just slot into a motherboard without extra cables. Uh, yep. So one of the lessons we learned is that the radio on Minx-1 can get really hot. And the radio is this sort of aluminum block. It's gray right here. Uh, and as you can see the aluminum block here, this is Minx-2. Uh, so when it's transmitting, radios aren't very efficient, so it generates a lot of heat. And we found that Minx-1, when you have the power setting really high, like we default it to when it first deploys, it can get itself so hot that it sort of goes on the fritz and the, the transmissions get intermittent and we can't decode them all. The solution for Minx-1 was just turn the power down and we're, we're okay. Um, but Minx-2 is going to be up for five years-ish, and so we don't want we wanted to keep the flexibility of being able to turn up the power if we need to for some reason. So we heat synced it. And that's what you can see here. The uh, right here is just this is a copper braid that's on the, the radio, and then it goes to a copper block, which we bolt to the back plate of the spacecraft, which is a dedicated radiator. So the end result of that is that when we're transmitting with Minx 1, we see the radio temperature increase by like 20 degrees. And with Minx 2, it's like 2 degrees. So it's a significant difference. And we shouldn't have any of those same kind of radio issues with Minx 2. And then one of the other things we've learned is it would be really nice to have more than one ground station. This is the one that's almost right above our heads here at LASP. This is our bird visitor that comes occasionally. It's now 500 watt. Uh, RF output so those birds shouldn't land there anymore because it would be bad. 
Um, but what we've found is that we, we can only downlink about 1% of all the data generated on Minx 1 with this single ground station. And we can choose which times we're going to downlink. So if there's a solar flare, we can downlink the high cadence data during that. And the rest of the time, just downlink one sample every five, 10 minutes, whatever it needs to be. But it would be nice to get more. Uh, so there's two ways you can do that. Either increase the, the bit rate. This is only 9,600 bits per second. So that's worse than 56K. <laughs> um, and, uh, or the other way is to have more ground stations. And so we weren't going to switch radios and turn everything, change the ground station and everything for Minx 2, so we're doing more ground stations. We have one that's being set up in Alaska now, um, and we've upgraded the software on Minx 2 so that we can store commands on board to downlink data at particular times. So if we know it's going to be over Alaska at some particular time, it will just automatically start dumping data at that time. Um, we also have partners in Taiwan that are building a ground station. It's actually already built. Um, and, and other places through this international program that Amal Chandran's running. There's probably going to be a lot of ground stations around the world that we could downlink to. And then you skirt all ITAR issues as well because they're not commanding anything. We're just downlinking over them. We're, broad, we're broadcasting over their, over their ground station. Uh, one of the good things on Minx 1 is that we're sort of doing that already. Um, but it's just health and safety information. Every nine seconds we generate a beacon that just gets broadcast that includes temperatures, voltages, currents, that sort of thing. And it just goes out. And when it's overhead boulder, that's when we know it's here. Um, when we can verify it's here, we can predict when it will show up. But that's how we really know it's there and still OK. But other people around the world, because this is UHF, there's ham radio operators that just have these ground stations at their house for fun. and so. They listen to these things, and they'll forward us the beacons. And so this is one of those people. Uh, we sent him a t-shirt, because he was sending us so much data. He's in Japan. Uh, and if you can't read it, his, his Facebook message just says, Dear Minx team, today a polo shirt arrived. Very thanks. And then <laughs> he signs off with his ham radio uh, 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 identifier. And so that's pretty cool. That we're not paying him anything. These are just volunteers around the world. That's one of the advantages of CubeSats using UHF is you just get these people that will send you data <laughs> as long as you're downlinking it periodically. Uh, so switching gears a little bit to the students, uh, this is another way of measuring the success of the program is the students that have been trained by it and have gone off elsewhere or in a few of our cases have stayed <laughs> or returned. Uh, so we're looking at different, different years here, different semesters, and you can see there's a base level of PhDs, sort of. Sometimes it was only one, which was me. Other times, like now, we have more, like Chris Moore, who's doing a lot of the science analysis and helping us with operations. Uh, and then the majority of the students have been master's students that have come from various departments, aerospace engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. And Chris now is from astrophysics and plan astrophysical and planetary sciences. And occasionally we get uh, undergrads, primarily through Marty Snow's REU program, uh, research uh, experience for undergrads. So these are students that come. We try to select students that are coming from uh, liberal arts colleges or small or small colleges that don't have research programs, so that they can get that sort of experience here. So we try to make help them realize whether or not they like research at all. And so we've had a bunch of students on Minx uh, do that sort of thing. And then some of them have applied for grad school here and come. And then you can see the one little red bit. We had a high school student uh, for a summer. And he helped a lot, actually. It was really good. He, he created our whole uh, assembly plan. So basically like the IKEA instructions for how to put together the spacecraft with all the, like literally it was a, this bolt and there was a picture of the bolt and pictures of every, how everything comes together. It was really good. And he helped with a lot of other stuff too. And you can also see that the students have come from a variety of countries, which is due to CU having uh, students coming, wanting to come here from uh, all over the place. So that's been really, really great too. Uh, one of the, the lucky things the students have gotten to do is meet some awesome people. Uh, so at top there is Charlie Bolden I mentioned, the like 
top of NASA. He was here a couple years ago, and he came and visited uh, a bunch of the students at CU, including the Minx ones with our poster there. And then just a couple weeks ago at the bottom here, that's Baina Mero, who, who worked on Minx for a few years, and she's talking to Tim Peake there, who's the astronaut that took these pictures of Minx coming out of the space station. And he's holding there the hinge that she designed for the solar panels that uh, was then 3D printed in, in stainless steel. And Charles Bolden also held that hinge, which is why Baina has it now in Scotland, which, where she's working in Clyde Space, because she was like, I'm keeping this one. <laughs> and now two, and Charles Bolden's also a, a former astronaut too, so two astronauts have held that thing and she's never given it up. Uh, and one of the other things that, this will relate to students, you'll see, we, we recently won the AIAA SmallSat Mission of the Year. Um, and this, this, the part that's related to students is that we didn't plan this, we didn't know that we were even nominated, but there was a bunch of Minx students there. Many of them had graduated and were working in various other places, but we were all at this conference at the same time. So it was sort of like an unorganized reunion, which was pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, so some of these students, uh, one of them's at Blue Canyon, one of them's at Clyde Space, Baina, which is in Scotland. Uh, another one's at Surrey, which the Denver branch, so there's a Surrey satellite systems in Denver, but their main office is in the UK, so we get to travel there all the time. So I'm kind of jealous. But you can also see where all the students have gone. I've been keeping track. Uh, so there's all the places you would expect, Ball and JPL and Lockheed, aerospace places here. There are several of us that got hired here. But then other ones you may not expect, like Apple and Seagate. Uh, and that's because the skills that the students have learned in the graduate projects working on CubeSats are very transferable. They're learning how to code. <laughs> They're learning how to do mechanical design. And that stuff is valuable outside of only aerospace applications. So it's been fun to, to follow where they're all going. We had another uh, sort of unofficial, unorganized uh, reunion uh, at the launch. Chris Moore was there, and I was there, and Andrew. Chris is one of the newer students, and Andrew uh, Kelly was one of the very first students, and we were all there. I learned a lesson not to go home after multiple scrubs because as soon as I left, they launched it, which sucked. <laughs> but I was at home watching the launch video with the speakers cranked all the way up, just to try and live the rocket launch. <laughs> it wasn't the same, though. No. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> yep. So they launched this. It was an Atlas 5401 configuration, which is had hundreds of launches without failures, which was very comforting to us because our original manifest, the thing we were originally manifested on blew up. So that would have been bad. Although the CubeSat, I, you know, Rick and I both saw the CubeSats that blew up on that launch and they were still fine. Don't know how you can be in a rocket explosion and still be fine, but somehow they were. Um, so we launched on the Atlas. This was an ISS resupply mission. So it was the, the Cygnus spacecraft that goes and is captured by the astronauts with the Canadian robotic arm. I literally pulled this picture from Twitter. The astronauts really like Twitter. I don't, it surprised me, but that's probably the fastest way to get astronaut news is from their tweets. Uh, and so this is cargo resupply, so it included uh, snacks and the EVA diapers and CubeSats. There was about 20 CubeSats, including Minx. And so they unloaded it all, and a couple months later, they loaded it back up onto a different robotic arm, the Japanese robotic arm. And then it got deployed, and that's what you saw in that first uh, title slide. Uh, so it's, it's been a pretty cool journey, I think, for a lot of the students to actually see the stuff you worked on go to space and then actually work. And now there's data re being returned from it and science publications coming from it. I think it still would have been valuable even if none of that latter stuff had happened, but it's been uh, really good for like me and Chris because now we can analyze the data and get more publications out of all this. <laughs> uh, I'm doing engineering publications too, but it's not the same as the science publications. Uh, so the last thing I'll show you is basically the making of Minx. It's a video. A picture's worth a thousand words, so I put together 200,000 pictures to basically cram together as much information as I could 
uh, without speaking them all. So that's what this is. It's the Hinode video again. This is what Minx is observing. Uh, and I wrote, I wrote the music to be synced up to the, the video, so you'll see that like when things happen. So it's thermal vacuum again. This is literally just downstairs, the thermal vacuum chamber. There's a lot of cables because we want a lot of temperature measurements on the surface. Deployments. We've done these kind of deployments dozens of times and they've never failed. We also took, uh, this is the antenna again on the roof. And this is that air bearing pointing at the sun again. In this video, it's not working. It's, it was one of the early ones. Here too, it's supposed to be stably pointed at the sun, but it's not. It will later in the video though. Here's the antenna deploying as promised. Literally a tape measure. It can't deploy against gravity, which fortunately you don't have that problem in space. And all conditions. So this is in the vacuum chamber while it's cold. And we showed that the, in a flight-like environment, the antenna could still deploy. And then we also characterize the antenna. This is at a company in Boulder called First RF with their enormous uh, anechoic chamber. So we can characterize the gain pattern of the antenna. And then to measure the spacecraft, it's gotta be exactly 34 centimeters and 10 centimeters. We had downstairs again, we had this tool for measuring that was way more precise than we needed, but why not use it? This is assembling the solar panels. We bought the cells but made the panels. Uh, they're literally stuck down with double-sided tape. It's capped on tape, which is like space duct tape. And so you can see here an entire panel being assembled. So then we get all the cells with the sticky tape on there, but then we need to put pressure. So we put it under this rubber mat and suck it down so that there's even pressure on all the cells and you don't shatter them. And if you put power into a solar panel, then they glow and didn't know that, but you can use that to find defects in the cells. So there's assembly again in CAD and here it is in reality. The binder back there is the assembly instructions that the, the high school student made for us. Constantly referring to that so as not to screw up. <laughs> and then we also calibrated the science instruments. We went to the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST, Synchrotron Ultraviolet Radiation Facility, and we calibrated. We also made sure the spacecraft would fit in the deployer as early as we could, and it did. And here it is, the, it's actually pointing at the sun now. Even if you knock it, it comes back. And all this shiny stuff on the outside is silver, uh, coated Teflon tape, so that makes it a, a good radiator surface. And I learned how to clean solar cells. They're fragile, so it was a lot of trial, careful trial and error. But you can do it. And this is yet another astronaut. This one's a professor, was a professor for graduate projects. We had a party at his house and needed something to sign, so he signed a box of Cheerios for a student. And then also just downstairs is a laser engraver. So I laser engraved the names of everyone that worked on the project. <coughs> And that's, you can just barely make it out in the video from the space station. So that's everybody that's worked on it uh, to date.
hopefully there will be more helping us with the science analysis. And that's, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. I can take questions and also before I forget, I put stickers out there too, Ming stickers with transparent backs, so you can take one of those too. Yeah. Yeah. I have plenty of questions, but uh, the main question is, why didn't you guys use an S band for a higher data rate? You can download the whole, especially that S band is available for CubeSat, and it, right. you guys have deployable solar panels, which gives you higher power throughput. Yeah, we, we will be in future missions. But we had a previous CubeSat, which was our first one, called Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment. They built the ground station here that was UHF, and they didn't need higher data rates. And it was uh, using a radio, the Lithium-1 radio, which has flown on dozens of CubeSats and is very proven because of that. So it was just heritage for that reason. And like I said, we only get 1% of the data, but we really don't need more than that. We meet, meet all of our requirements. It'd just be nice if we could get more. And the missions coming up are going to need more. And so we, that's why we're working on replacing this ground station with an S band. Yeah. When's the next launch? Uh, it was January for Minx 2, but they've, uh, Skybox is, which is now Terabella and is owned by Google, they graciously gave us a free ride. and their spacecrafts are taking longer to, to, to do than they thought, so there's been a delay. Um, so it's now sometime the first half of 2017 is as, as narrow as we know it. What are you going up on? Uh, Minotaur C. So hopefully the fairing opens this time and it doesn't go down like glory. <laughs> it's a Taurus. But that, I thought, at least Tom told me that they just renamed it. <laughs> just rebrand it, and it's got 100% success right now. <laughs> Where was the launch that you showed in here? That was from Kennedy in Florida. The next one will be from Vandenberg in California. The nice thing about this, the Minx-1 launch from Kennedy was it was ISS resupply, so it was going to be months before Minx deployed. And as soon as it deploys, you have to be in here doing the operations. So. We were able to go watch the launch, but the next one, I don't know if Tom's going to let me go watch it, because as soon as it launches, like 10 minutes later, Minx is going to be overhead. And so we need to operate it, so, yeah. Will you be doing the same kind of study, or something different? Yeah, we made everything a little bit better, and it's a much longer life for the mission. So we can focus on similar but different uh, uh, science. So because it's going to be five years-ish, we can start to look at the solar cycle. The sun varies um, every year, every 11 years it's on a cycle. So we can see a pretty big chunk of that 11 year cycle with Minx 2 and characterize that, which is not possible with a three month to, to 12 month mission. We also on Minx 2 have higher dynamic range of the instrument, so we'll be able to see bigger flares without saturating. Yeah. yeah uh, on your slide showing the rate of success for CubeSats uh -huh. during 2005 to 2015, mm -hmm. uh, there's a 60% increase in failure. Do you think like uh, implementing a systematic approach for building CubeSats will reduce? Or is it due to the fact that a lot of uh, universities went to the market that impacted the the high rate of failures. Right. You're talking about in general or just that 2015 no, year? I'm, I'm comparing 2005 to 2015. Oh. Uh, 2015 was a bit of a weird one or 2014? Or, or, or 100% success? Yeah, that's probably because there's only a couple of them. <laughs> if it's in percentage, it's hard to tell the number. The number has also been steadily increasing with time. And rocket failures are also included in there. So if a rocket blows up and there's a dozen CubeSats on it, then you have a dozen failures. Um, which is not the fault of the CubeSats, but it would help if, I think testing is the main thing that a lot of people skip because it's right at the end of the program and you run out of time. And so you either deliver or you miss the launch because they will not delay the launch for a secondary payload like a CubeSat typically is. So people, I think, tend to just cut out the test program and 
if you do that, then you're increasing the likelihood of failure. So you guys follow the standard procedure for building the CubeSat? Was there like an existing standard, like NASA standard or? ESA yes, or? yep. So we followed the, like those four tests I showed plus power positive are all things that are recommended that keeps, keeps and are required for big cube or for big satellites, but uh, small CubeSats, the only requirement handed down is that you can't do anything for 30 minutes after deployment because you could mess up the primary uh, payload. And uh, you have to show that you're not going to, during vibration, you're not going to throw stuff everywhere because you're breaking apart. Um, but uh, with we had a lot of involvement of LASP and LASP professionals like Rick here um, that knew how to do it right, but also knew how to do it without tons of oversight and paperwork. So we were able to do the same sort of tests and make sure that things were going to work without getting bogged down too much on the administrative side so that we could afford to do these tests. Yep. Systematic analysis of what potential failed mechanisms for the ones which failed, which deployed and failed. Yeah. <coughs> there, I don't know for sure, but if there is, it would probably be in the NASA white paper. I think NASA's been doing this annual review of all CubeSat technologies, which so is I supposed to include that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It would be nice. If, if there's something which they would do wrong, yeah, sometimes that does get, those systematic types of mistakes will get caught, or like a one-off that's like, nobody ever do this again. <laughs> yeah, like the, the CubeSat design specification by Cal Poly has included lessons learned like that and turned them into requirements. Like, you can't, you can no longer have permanent magnets stronger than a particular strength. Um, because one time there was one with a strong magnet, and there was another CubeSat in the deployer, and they came out and they were stuck to each other. And so they, then they couldn't communicate because their antenna would deploy or whatever, but the ground plane's all screwed up because they're connected. And so that, you know, now that's a requirement that you can't do that. So I think some of that gets captured in the design specifications, but I don't think there's anybody that's been this focused. Sort out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that database is almost, the ESA one is almost scarily complete. I, fi I find stuff on, about Minx on there that I'm like, how did you even get this? <laughs> I didn't, like, I don't know anybody that gave it to you, but they have it there. It's pretty crazy. And the, the uh, stalwart one, his, his papers are really good, but they tend not to go into de detail about the specific missions. But at least they would give you a place where, a contact, so you could be like, okay, this mission failed. I could contact them and try and find out why. Yep. Did you consider any redundancy on the mix? The whole spacecraft was redundant with mix too. <laughs> so within one cube? Uh, mostly no, uh, because that is one way to deal with risk in bigger missions, but it also introduces a lot of complexity. And increased complexity means you have to test it, otherwise that could be another failure point. And so we wanted to keep the testing plan simple so we could actually get through it. So. I'm trying to think of anywhere we have redundancy. So then, sort of. Because if one didn't deploy, then ah uh, yeah. We are still power. We are still power positive, limitedly power positive. <laughs> we didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to duty cycle. Yeah. We don't have redundant. Really redundant because you can't do the mission. Right. Without it, but you do it. We live. Yep. <laughs> We're starting to move some things to redundant in the graduate projects course now. We now have two processors that are both sort of the command and data handling, and I'm really trying to push the students not to do that because it's going to become a nightmare. Um, but, batteries? yeah. Power system, like batteries, is it redundant? No, none of that's redundant. Uh, 
it would be nice. So the other nice thing about Minx 2 is it's going into a sun synchronous orbit, but unfortunately it's not dawn dusk. If it was, that would mean it's in the sun all the time and you wouldn't need batteries at all. Um, so we were kind of hoping for that because it would be great for our science. It would be great for not having the batteries limit the life of the mission and not needing to make them redundant or anything. But they are definitely not redundant and we didn't have volume to make them redundant either. We think the CSSWE CubeSat was limited by the batteries, but that ran, it was supposed to be a three month mission and it ran for two and a half years. So, I mean, we could make it redundant, but it, it's just more complexity to test. Yep. And what, what was the required bonding accuracy for the mission? Uh, I, I'd have to look it up for sure, but our field of view for the primary science instrument is plus or minus four degrees and the sun is half a degree, so you have to just keep that inside the field of view of the instrument. Uh, and jitter's not really a problem as long as you're jittering within, in, within the field of view. Because we're not doing imaging, we're just doing spectra, so the, ang the precise angle doesn't matter too much. So you need an orbit propagation for that, for, to, to, to point your spacecraft, your CubeSat to the the target, right? You mm -hmm. need to know where, where are you in the orbit. Yeah, so that's all so included in the Blue Canyon. Or what kind of model do you they do, so Blue Canyon's thing is awesome. It does all of that internally. Um, it, you can optionally add a GPS, and it would have, that's another would have been nice to have things, but we, we tried to put it in Minx 2. Uh, but the GPS, surprisingly, is really large. I don't know why. The one in your phone is tiny. Uh, the reason it would be nice is because then it could update its own time and its own location and velocity. Right now we have to upload that information periodically. Um, you upload two-line elements? Uh, the ephemeris, which is we derive from the two-line element. And then it, it goes into the orbit propagator on board and then it propagates. But because the altitude's decreasing and it's experiencing more and more drag, the orbit propagator isn't, doesn't account for that and so it gets off. And now we have to upload the ephemeris three times a week, and it's looking like we probably need to do it four or five times a week now. Whereas before, when the mission started, it was once every week or two. And CSSWE was once every week or two, and Minx 2 will be once every week or two, but it's just because of the drag we need to do it so often. Whereas if we, with GPS, we'd never have to do it. definitely does because we're pointing at the sun so when we come out of eclipse and the sun's over there we're going to be like the the giant face of the spacecraft is going to be directly the in the y axis, right? yeah so that'll be experiencing a lot of drag other times we'll have the minimum profile like at noon then we'll have the minimum profile in the drag so it's a little bit complicated because it's not pointed relative to the earth in any way it's pointed on the sun uh, but so the drag profile changes as a function of times, and most simple orbit propagator things on the ground, like with SDK, you have to just provide one drag coefficient, and like you have to average the entire spacecraft over time, and then use that. There are more complicated ones you can use, where you can put the geometry in and the pointing, and then propagate, but we haven't seen the need to do that. And, and your ADS system used the uh just reaction wheels or it's used a magnetic system as well, magnetic actuators? Uh, both, both, yep, three reaction wheels, so also not redundant there in reaction yeah. wheels. Our next CubeSat may, we have mass and volume for four reaction wheels, so we're doing that in the pyramid configuration. Um, but the exact has three, the ADCS we have, has three reaction wheels for control and then three torque rods to dump momentum. You could use them for control if you wanted, but that would probably require a flight software change. How, how large are the Tucker rods? Oh, I don't remember the uh, number. Because I didn't see Tucker rods in the, in the CAD model that you... Yeah, it's all just inside that one little box at the top. Three reaction wheels, a star tracker, a sun sensor, three torque rods, all the electronics to process all of it, and IMU. All of that's encapsulated in that little box, which I only said is dense, but that's all the stuff that's in there to make it that dense. Yep. Yeah. 
I, I had temp music in there for a long time, and I got permission from the people that made it. It was a an orchestral te Tetris cover, and I got permission to use it for like a NASA uh, presentation, but they wouldn't give me permissions beyond that, so I had to write my own. <laughs> Yep. The, the environmental testing that you did, I didn't see that you did any acoustic vibe testing. Mm -mm. No? Vibe was loud, but it was not acoustic testing. <laughs> that is something else we could have done. We just don't have the facilities here. And we didn't, I don't know, we didn't, I'm not aware of any nearby that we could have used for cheap or free. The nice thing about our current CubeSats that are running now is we've gotten a lot of that testing for free, like the anechoic chamber testing and vibe testing has been free. Uh, because the total budget for this whole Minx thing was only one million, we had to find places we could tolerate risk, and that was one of them. But, but, but that's very risky. You might not at all pass the, the launch. Yeah, I don't know. Rick could probably answer that better than I could, why we accepted that one. So CubeSats, so there's Anything else? Yeah, I guess so. Yep. Can ask a question? Go ahead. I'm not asking a lot of questions. So, Dr. Mason, <laughs> lots of experiences with this cube set. Good and bad. What's your favorite memory so far? I think deployment, even though it was, it was in this room at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but that was definitely the most, I think, memorable and exciting was like seeing it actually come out. We didn't know if it was going to work yet, but because of all that testing, I was pretty sure it was going to work. So I wasn't really that scared for that. Yeah, I would say that. And I did actually, blood, sweat, and tears, I did bleed too. When I was cutting the, uh, the springs for the hinges, the little piano uh, steel springs, they, you'd snip it and they would launch somewhere. You'd never find it again. One of them went right into my thumb and I was bleeding. So there was blood. <laughs> <laughs> and tears when I made the mistake of messing up the batteries during the thermal vacuum test. That was like entirely my mistake. <laughs> but fortunately, we were able to figure it out. All right. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. Thanks.